prepared fluid, a serum containing antibodies, proteins that will neutralize the venom in the snake bite. The patient has survived the night, but the tissue damage continues for a while. There is still venom present. Although snakes are not trying to kill us, it's worth knowing how some of them bite. The next snake that I have here, it's uh, Africa's most venomous snake. And this is a boom slung. It has drop for drop the strongest venom of any snake in Africa, more so than a black mamba or any of the cobras. Most people think that a back fang snake can't bite uh, onto a large part of your body. Most people think that the, the boom slung can only latch onto your earlobe or small finger. But as you can see here, this is not true, in that the whole head of the snake is divided in half by its mouth. And they can open that mouth up to about 120 degrees. And with the mouth that wide open, they could very easily bite you on the flat of your hand or the top of your leg, wherever it pleases. If you were bitten by the snake, you would literally bleed to death. So what's going to happen to you is that you're going to bleed into your heart, into your stomach, into your bowels. You're going to be urinating blood, defecating blood, and it's really a horrific way to die. This poor frog is about to be the victim of a vine snake in Central America. This snake is also backfanged, just like the boomslang. Fortunately for small prey, death comes quickly. The venom of some snakes with fixed fangs attacks the nerves. Now, the front uh, fixed fang snake that I've chosen is a snouted cobra here. These fangs are much smaller than the front hinged fangs of an adder. Those fangs don't have to fold backwards. You see, they remain erect in the mouth. So the snake merely has to snarl its mouth and so inject its venom. And sometimes a mere scratch is enough to kill you. The neurotoxins would interfere with the neural communication system of our body and paralyze uh, the vital organs, so the heart or the diaphragm muscle, and one would die from asphyxiation. You literally cannot breathe and possibly die of heart attack. In most countries where people face a daily risk of encountering snakes, wood piles and exposed trash heaps are surprisingly common, yet all can encourage snake trouble. Wood piles provide shelter for snakes, and trash attracts rats. What better prey is there here in Africa for a black mamba? Six feet of powerful hunter, it haunts the outbuildings and can strike like lightning with a quick working venom. To a black mamba, this bungalow is just another place where food may be in good supply. Inside, Tony Morgan confronted an uninvited guest, and it bit him. This is a typical uh, corner that snakes like to hide in, and it was a similar corner like this near my front door on the farm that I found a mamba all curled up here with my fishing rods and various things like that. And as I don't kill anything, particularly snakes, I grabbed this uh, particular implement and I thought that I, I hooked him out and I thought that I pinned him down. Unfortunately, he, he was able to stretch quite a bit and he got me uh, just below the knee with one fang. I then lasted exactly 30 minutes. Uh, and my wife uh, got me down to Donald's place very quick and then he took over and drove me down to the hospital where we were fortunate in finding a doctor on duty. And 30 minutes after the bite, I said to him, I cannot exhale anymore. And he said at the same time, which I didn't hear, um, his heart has stopped as well. So in effect, I was dead at that time.
Bill Host in Florida is the kind of person to whom Tony Morgan owes his life. But collecting venom to make anti-venom has almost cost Bill his own life. I was bitten by a cobra and ended up in a respirator. I had stopped breathing. <clears throat> I was bitten by a mamba in the leg, a king cobra bite in the knee. Well, my blood pressure went to zero. But the most recent one, which was a uh, cane break rattlesnake <clears throat> a couple of months ago, I got bitten on the back of the hand. That was almost pure carelessness. Bill, who's nearly 90, milks venom into a collecting jar while he gently squeezes the venom glands. But how has he survived 168 bites? The answer may be quite natural. The South African Cape Cobra, a highly venomous snake, is prey to meerkats. But why are meerkats apparently unaffected by frequent cobra bites? They seem to be immune. Perhaps the frequency of such bites is a clue to Bill's survival. Back in 1948, September the 18th, to be exact, I started immunizing myself with venom from the Cape Cobra of South Africa. I diluted the venom 10,000 times and took one hundredth of a milliliter. Then I graduated or increased the dose over months and then eventually years, added different species <clears throat> until now on Usually, w once a week, I take a booster, and it's a mixture of 32 different species. So, <clears throat> I know that got me through a lot of these bites, at least over the threshold, if not in most cases, uh, saved my life. Snakes and humans share the world uneasily. This spectacled cobra is common in the paddy fields of India. Every year, more than 10,000 people are killed here by snake bite. Antivenom is unavailable. For the same reason, snake bite is a major killer across Central and South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. It's hard to arrive at an exact number, but at the lowest estimate, 50,000 people die each year. In South Africa, Donald Stridham is answering an emergency call. In this part of South Africa, we have a lot of venomous snakes. People are active in the field here. They often come across snakes, they find them in their houses, and that's when uh, we are called out. Seems to be the place over here. Lots of people standing around there. A snake in a house is a cause for local excitement. But the occupants have already followed the right emergency procedures. Everyone has left the house. And they've not only closed the door, but sealed it as well, with a towel. Donald can be fairly sure that the snake is still inside. What I'm going to do here is um, have to put a vise on because in a situation like this, it's very possibly a spitting snake. So um, I'm just gonna get a few things that I need here. Yeah, there's really a lot of hiding places here. A snake could be anywhere. Um, this is really, yeah, it's a bit dark in here as well, so one's gonna be really careful. Just take care where you, where you walk over there. Um, just take it easy. There's, there, there are places around you where it could easily just spring out on you. So if you guys just stay back a bit there. Um, I'm going to have a look in these dark areas. I need to stay in the open area of the floor because I suspect it to be behind things around like this here. Oh, that's clear. Um, You know, we could so easily find a mumba in a place like this. And these things are like coiled springs. I mean, once it feels that it's not hidden anymore, it could just come flying out.
You see, these are perfect. You'd find rodents here as well. And this is what the snake is probably looking for. Or to just try to hide from the disturbances outside, possibly. You know, this whole area is really, really good. Look at these mats under here. No, nothing there. Um, you know, they, they, I don't know. Sometimes they even find an escape. They could actually maybe even get out from where um, the, the door, door was plugged out there. It could have pushed past there. But um, I think we just maybe should carry on looking. You know, it could also have climbed. I mean, these walls are pretty rough up here. I could take a, a look somewhere up here. There. Oh, no. There's something up there. There's something in the corner over there. Um, yeah. Okay, without a doubt, that's a mamba. It's a black mamba. Um, there's a piece of coil just around the, between the roof and the, and the uh, wall there. We know that mambas are very, very poisonous. I mean, if this bites us, we're quite far from a, a hospital now. So we've got to be really, really careful. And if you can just stay in the furthest uh, corner away from me there, just out of my way, I'm going to bring it down and just get it straight past you outside and then deal with it, get it into the bag. Okay, it's trying to edge away from me there. Let's head out again. warning me. You know, it's interesting that the snake doesn't just come out attacking, but at this stage, having it like this, it obviously feels threatened. At this stage, it'll bite whatever comes near to its mouth. And that's, oh, it's a big snake, bigger than I thought. It's a long animal. Just watch it behind me there. Please don't just come any closer than that. You know, the snake's obviously hyped up now, and whatever touches it through the bag, it's going to bite. And you can see through the bag here. I'm going to just turn it down to the side, make sure that it's safe in one area, and then I'm going to release the head. Just take care, they don't come too close. No, you just touch that bag and this thing bites. I'm going to find a safe place to uh, release it. Let's get it in there. And I think I should go and reassure the lady here that her house is clear of snakes and uh, that it's safe to go back in again. Housewives in India are troubled by snakes as well. The men of Vindravan have also made a profession out of removing them. He's not going to let this cobra go free. For hundreds of years, this has been a village of snake charmers. The snake is captivated by the swaying pipe, following every rocking movement. And that's the snake charmer's secret. The music plays no part. It's probably too high a frequency for the snake to appreciate. It has no eardrums. Sound vibrations are perceived only by way of the skin, muscle, and bone. Bites are a routine hazard for charmers, but they have a special snake stone, which they believe can magically draw venom from the wound. Survival is most likely to depend on the snake only biting in defense, 
using little or no venom. Also, the victim himself may have received many mild bites in his lifetime and developed some immunity. But the piece of soapstone is the treatment they believe in. This baby cobra in Africa is one snake that no snake charmer would ever use. It threatens the civet cat by standing tall and looking big. But it has another weapon. This is a spitting cobra, and it sprays venom, which irritates the eyes of the attacker. It's not lethal, but it works. South America, the Llanos of Venezuela, the wetland home of the largest snake in the world, the anaconda. This giant has no venom at all. To capture prey, it relies on muscle power, coiling around its victim and squeezing the breath out of it. And a large snake needs large prey. The biggest rodent in the world fits the role. A capybara, the size of a pig, is fairly easy to ambush as it bathes in the warm waters. The snake must have teeth strong enough to hold on to such lively prey and be ready to loop its body tightly around the capybara to avoid being bitten or scratched. The anaconda, the most powerful of constrictors, moves in. To be safe, the actor needed to know exactly how a large constrictor kills, just as Donald Stridham does. I caught this snake on somebody's farm. It had eaten something really large, and uh, the farmer was worried it's going to eat his dogs or even maybe his children, which isn't uh, totally unrealistic. Have a look at that. Yeah, it's getting me around the arm here. I can really feel it. You get this area here, I mean, you can see how it's stopping the blood supply there. And uh, this is my arm, so I mean, I can handle it. Can, I can wrap it off me here. But can you imagine that around somebody's neck? Um, that, I mean, that's pretty, pretty tight over here. This movie that we watched, we've just seen it with this Jimmy, where it had wrapped around him. Um, it wasn't totally wrapped around his neck, not like the way this has got me around the arm here. With uh, Jimmy, I could literally see that he turned around to get this python around his body, and it wasn't a natural constricting pose. Whereas this snake has got me. I mean, look at that. My arm's getting quite red there. You know, if you make a plan here, really got me. One thing I got right in the uh, movie was that uh, the python, like many other non-venomous snakes, are ambush, ambush animals. They will lie in ambush for their prey. It'll lie there, wait for the animal to come past, strike at it, bite it, and hook it with those hundred needle-sharp teeth. It then throws coils around this animal while it pulls the animal into the coils. It then asphyxiates the animal. Every time it breathes out, it tightens more and more, and the animal dies of suffocation. If one looks into the mouth of this python, you can see a little circular tube, and that is the extension of its epiglottis. And it's very useful for a snake to have this, because what happens is, when it swallows, that'll extend right out of the mouth, and so it can still breathe while it's got a full mouth of uh, antelope. I think uh, the snake uh, deserves to be released now, so not to stress it uh, too much, I'm going to release it here in the bush. And this looks ideal here. And as soon as I let the head go, 
That's it, I can feel. I can feel the coils have immediately relaxed on me there. And the snake just wants to get away. Straight into the bush there. Wow, look at that arm. This arm's gone really quite red there. What a relief to have that off. This is great. I love letting snakes go back into the bush. It's such a nice feeling. If you can do something for them as well, it's a nice feeling for me and hopefully for the snake. Back in anaconda country, there's someone who's trying to do good things for them as well. Anacondas have killed and eaten people, but that fact does not deter Maria Munoz. At the ranch of El Cedral, the petite Maria is on the track of her favorite animal. She works with her assistant, Ramon. A snake longer than 10 feet always requires two people for safe handling. It's the breeding season for anacondas, and Maria recognizes this group as small males. She hopes they will lead her to the much larger females somewhere nearby. The males are placed in bags to keep them out of the way. The female they find is 13 feet long. Maria uses a trick to calm it down. She dips its head in the mud so it can't see. For several years, Maria has been studying how anaconda populations here live and vary. The tail. I would like to know is new one or we have the mark. Let me see the clock. Good. It's a new female for us. That's mean there are more than 900 anacondas, green anaconda in this ranch. Before Maria began her work, no one knew how many anacondas could live here. Now, by taking blood samples for DNA, she is also getting some idea about how they are related. But of course, she still needs to know how long these giants are. Her personal best is nearly 20 feet, about 10 feet short of the world anaconda record. Yeah. These are the heaviest snakes in the world. But this one is a little lighter than the 485 pound monster in the record books. 44.45 kilogram. Some snakes, like this South African tiger snake, not only constrict their prey, but are also venomous. I've got the tiger snake's favorite prey. It is a striped skink. Now I'm going to bring it in closer, and you're going to notice that the tiger snake will bite and poison its prey, also wrap around it to constrict and kill. Now this is, of course, a dead skink, so I'm going to move it around so that the snake thinks that it's alive. The tiger snake's venom is weak, so it needs to grip the lizard firmly, not only to prevent escape, but to limit the risk of damage to itself during a struggle. Even more remarkable is an African egg-eating snake's ability to get its mouth around an egg. All snakes can eat meals bigger than their heads. They simply open very wide, and then ligaments allow the lower jaw to expand. Still, the egg cannot be crushed until it reaches special bones in the spine, which can pierce the shell. For convenience, a snake does better to eat another snake. A king cobra is called king because it's a snake eater. The mangrove snake it's attacking is only mildly venomous. No match for the king.
It's not easy for the king to judge exactly how long this meal is. But since the king is the largest venomous snake in the world, chances are the victim's tail will be reached easily and swallowed. It's good to be the king. So how would a snake avoid this fate? One way would be to play dead. This eastern hog-nosed snake is giving his best performance. Its play acting must convince a threatening indigo snake. There is an interesting moment of standoff, but the actor has another defensive card to play. A gland in its tail emits a smell of death to go with the gaping mouth. It's the performance of a lifetime, and the enemy is fooled. A snake that looks dangerous can keep predators away. Red next to yellow will kill a fella is a useful rhyme about a coral snake. It is venomous. Red next to black is a friend of Jack is true for a milk snake. It mimics warning colors and only pretends to be dangerous. A pretend head keeps the real head of a Calabar ground python safe. The real head has a tongue that gives it away. But the deception can be good enough to cause a predator to attack the tail by mistake. And a tail is not a vital organ. Often the brilliant colors and patterns of a snake's skin are not a warning but a subtle camouflage matching its surroundings. And to us, it can look beautiful. Scales come in endless varieties of shape and structure. In the wild, snakes are not easily seen, a useful quality which suits these masters of ambush perfectly. But the beauty and subtlety of snakeskin has also been their undoing for thousands of years. Fire is traditionally used by hunters in Cameroon to expose the hiding places of aggressive rock pythons. Entering an aardvark burrow to retrieve so vicious a snake is a risk few men will undertake. Once this nightmare task was a test of virility, a rite of passage. Crawling inch by inch on toes and fingers, the hunter moves toward the angry python. His companions keep track of his progress. They may have to rescue him. The heat is stifling. The hunter must squirm back through dust and biting ants, dragging a hundred pounds of python. His companions take over. These are the last of the python hunters left in Cameroon. Firearms have made it easier to kill other animals for food and skins. But the meat on this snake in former times would have been essential, and its skin a profitable result from such horrific effort. As any snake grows, it must shed its outer skin like an overtight suit. The new scales revealed are at their best. The cast-off skin is discarded, and with it also go most of the parasites that have attached themselves to the snake.
The regular shedding of dead skin has special significance for rattlesnakes. Each time a rattlesnake slips out of its old skin, its rattle gains another section at the base. The rattle is a series of loose-fitting interlocking scales that, when shaken, produce a sound that warns large animals not to step on the snake. Although only a warning, the rattle has been the snake's downfall. Their noise makes them easy to locate, and as a result, tens of thousands are killed every year. I hate rattlesnakes. J.P. Jones sees rattlesnakes only as potential killers of people and livestock. He's hunted them since he was a boy, but recently he's finding it harder to find them. He simply can't hear them, even with the listening apparatus he designed himself. There are rattlers around, but many are becoming quieter. Ruthless hunting is exterminating the loudest, and a greater proportion of snakes with weak rattles are living and breeding. Not having a loud warning, of course, makes a snake even more dangerous. But J.P. is undaunted and his roundup goes on, presumably until only silent rattlesnakes survive in his part of Alabama. Yeah, I've been doing this for a long time. 78 years old, but I still enjoy it. Getting rid of snakes anywhere is never the good idea it might seem. Farmers in Vietnam didn't value the many snakes that once lived in the paddy fields until they vanished. The snakes were trapped for food, and the rice crop was attacked by rats. A third of the country's crops was devastated by the rodents. The return of natural predators, such as pythons, could save the farmers' livelihoods. The government's official snake repatriator is Dr. Nagoyan. He's bringing snakes to the village where he was born. A true pioneer whose vision led to photo identification. He started learning about the societies that these whales live in around our coast and that these were incredibly complex animals with very elaborate social relationships. You put the brain and the implications of that together with the social side and you understand immediately that putting her in a concrete tank and uh, completely shutting off the company of her kind was an enormously unfair and inappropriate thing to be doing. But at the time, it was through the close contact of captivity that we begin to learn about them, one at a time. The story of one whale in particular, named Keiko, stirred our passion and raised enduring questions about captivity. Keiko was captured in 1979 in Iceland and became one of the 136 orcas taken into captivity since 1961. But he did not become one of the more than 100 that have died there or one of the 42 killer whales that remain in captivity. Captured at age two, and eventually sent to Mexico City, Keiko was breathing the world's smoggiest air, a master of the ocean at 7,000 feet above sea level, in the artificial seawater of a shallow pool, where he entertained the crowds. Keiko would have lived his life in poor health, swimming in circles except for one thing, he became a movie star. As Willie, he was free to 10 million film-going children. But in reality, Keiko went nowhere. The stress of his environment caused a skin disease, which spread as his health seriously deteriorated. The real whale was slowly dying, and Keiko had to be moved. When it was learned that Keiko was still captive, Millions of children wrote in, demanding his freedom, 
and a spontaneous movement was started to free the sick whale. Keiko's owners donated him for the unprecedented experiment of reintroducing him into the wild. And the Oregon Coast Aquarium customized a pool for his care. Suddenly, the reality of freeing Keiko became far more interesting than the movie, as Keiko began a long and complicated journey toward freedom. Ultimately, true freedom for Keiko would mean being accepted into a pod of wild whales, since orcas live their entire lives in tightly connected social groups where all members are related to each other. It's now understood the best chance for Keiko would be to find his mother. It very much is a matriarchal society or matrilineal in that everybody in the group is related through female descent to a, a female ancestor. Individuals stay with their mother or their grandmother for the whole life. And it took some years to really understand that because it is very unusual in that the large adult males never leave the group. The bond between a mature male and, and his mother is very, very strong. I know that Eve, the whale that came to you in the fog, was a matriarch. What happened when she passed away? Eve only had two sons, no, no daughters. And those two males went around Hanson Island for weeks and didn't survive her death for very long. Generally, the males will join their sister's family, but they, they become a loose satellite. They never again have the bond that they had with their mother. It's a unique social system. Orca is a very conservative animal. Basically, you only uh, socialize with somebody who your mother introduced you to. The resident populations on this coast are really fairly clearly divided socially into two different groups. The northern residents, it's about 240 whales, 16 pods. The southern residents are around 90 whales, 3 pods, quite a bit smaller. What's really interesting, and we don't really understand this, but they never mix. And then we have overlaying that, we have transients, the mammal hunters. They don't mix with the residents, but they will often mix with other transients. And then occasionally we have these offshore whales, and they don't mix with these others either. So we have these whales that in, in many ways are just focused on their very familiar neighboring groups that are of the same lifestyle. It's a pattern strangely familiar, much like human tribes, existing near each other, but separate with languages and behaviors learned and passed on over generations. We define it as culture. And for both humans and orcas, different cultures exist among the same species. Did you get that carry? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I so. That was amazing. Yeah. Well, see, I told you that's oh, two boys, huh? And, I and they both did that. Yeah, they both did that. Oh, my God! <laughs> The New Zealand orca I found are just so completely different from the Pacific Northwest. I had this paradigm that that was how orca were around the world. They, they had a matrilineal society and stayed in very um, strongly bonded groups and that there was another population who fed on marine mammals. Well, it turns out here that the New Zealand orca are moving around between groups. They feed on fish, sharks, rays and marine mammals. Acoustically, they're different. They have a good kiwi twang, just like I do. <laughs> and it looks like they're moving big distances compared to the animals up there. I've got them traveling an average of 100 to 150 kilometers a day. And I think that's one of the things that fascinates me about orca is the different cultures. Even though they're in similar habitats, they're just so completely different. Orcas have been stable in the social groups that we're looking at now for literally thousands of years. If you look at the society and understand that this has evolved over a very long period of time, you realize that you're looking at a, at a successful society. The wild part. The challenge for him would be enormous since strong social bonds may actually define what it means to be an orc. At the time, no one knew how to free a captive orca. It was a new frontier to trainers like Steve Clausen and to Jean-Michel who became involved in the effort and who saw Keiko as a symbol of more than just one whale. Curator Nolan Harvey knew how far Keiko was from a wild orca. We're trying to teach Keiko to not only work for us within this pool so we can take better care of him, but we need to let him become a killer whale again. We need to untrain him. Our goal all along has been to give him control of his life. 
we're an active part of it, especially since he is here by himself. But the idea is to let him start making those decisions on what he wants to do, when he wants to do it. Or previously, anytime he did anything, it was because somebody asked for it. Even with vastly improved conditions, Keiko continued to demonstrate his frustration from living in an artificial environment. He expressed his stress in Mexico by gnawing the concrete pool, damaging his teeth, and it continued in Oregon on his favorite rock. A decision was made to cover it in order to discourage the behavior and to protect the teeth of the ocean's greatest predator. An orca's sharp, conical-shaped teeth make feeding on large prey possible, but Keiko primarily eats fish, which orcas swallow whole, so his damaged teeth should not be a problem in the wild. When he arrived in Oregon, Keiko was a thousand pounds underweight, but soon doubled what he was eating in Mexico. His waistline increased by three feet. He gained nearly 2,000 pounds and grew eight inches longer. But he still had to be taught to catch live fish as a milestone for his release and in order to survive in the wild. Accustomed to only dead fish, at first he treated the live meal like a toy. Surrounded by walls, Keiko had never been observed using echolocation in captivity. And to a wild killer whale, it's a fundamental skill. The whale's hearing spectrum is many times ours. Their sensitivity is incredible. They see with sound, so when they're finding food, they use their echolocation. They make sounds, they get echoes, and they can turn that into a mental three-dimensional image somehow. You know, when you go into different places around the world and you, you look, at, uh, look at what orcas are doing and understand that they've sort of figured out how to live in the particular niche that they happen to have found, it's really interesting looking at the differences. As gray whales migrate up the coast through Monterey, California, a pod of transient orcas show why they're called wolves of the sea. They hunt in packs to isolate, then overpower a gray whale calf. It's a predictable hunt, with as many as a third of the calves taken by orcas. Twenty to thirty whales may work together and share the bounty. Sharing seems to be really important in these groups. It seems to be part of the way that the whales live together to avoid competition. Certainly they food share when it comes to feeding on, on larger animals, but that's probably more a facet of the fact that these things that they're feeding on like whales are so big and there's not many of them in terms of they kill one, then everybody has to feed on it. A female, the best hunters, will bring up a fish and others from her matriline will come over and share that prey item. What's kind of surprising for the residents, they will share even a salmon that's perhaps only uh, five, ten pounds. They will share that even though any whale in the group could easily swallow it. It has given us a new appreciation and, and insight into the workings of their society. That said, even though their dietary preference is culturally maintained and driven, they don't seem to be really adaptable in the short term. It might take a while before they can start focusing on alternative species. Killer whales are real traditionalists. They only do what mom did. They eat what mom eats and they socialize with the whales that mom socialized with. They really don't like to branch out. So if you have a habitat change and that particular prey is not there anymore, then it's difficult for the orca to adapt. Within decades, and for a variety of reasons. Orcas throughout the world may be at the crossroads of adaptation or extinction as their prey diminishes, something the resident whales of the Pacific Northwest now face. It's a growing issue for the future, but is similar to the question of whether Keiko would be able to adapt to hunting live fish in the wild. Without another whale to teach him, Keiko initially seemed confused about the shift in his diet until finally either hunger or common sense kicked in and he began to catch a few live fish in the wild that wouldn't be enough using ultrasound to measure Keiko's fat layer or blubber the staff identified where it would show if he weren't eating enough in theory 
By measuring his blubber so easily in the wild from an extended pole, scientists could know if and when they would have to intervene. They did know that Keiko would have to be in better shape than he had ever been. So even his 30 different toys were designed with a purpose. Filled with water, a 200 pound ball became Keiko's workout. When he first arrived, Keiko could barely hold his breath for three and a half minutes. He soon progressed to almost 18, normal for a wild killer whale. But Keiko was still far from a wild whale, which was vividly seen when at night, he gathered his toys around him to sleep. An array of cameras and hydrophones captured Keiko's movements and sounds. Taking advantage of this opportunity, scientists carefully analyzed his vocalizations, trying to match them with specific behaviors, hoping to take a step toward understanding killer whale communication. Keiko, however, had not communicated with another orca in more than 20 years. I was studying a pair of whales called Orky and Corky. They would begin conversations with certain sounds and end conversations with certain sounds. And I realized that studying communication between those two whales in captivity would be like studying communication between two people in a prison. That there was no way that I was going to actually learn what they were saying and the real context of their lives. I'll tell you the, the main thing about Corky, and, and she's a survivor. She has been in captivity for 38 years, about 43 years old, which is incredibly old for a captive orca. Most of them die within 10 years. She still uses the calls of the A5 pod, and uh, she is swimming in run, run the tank, and in a concrete tank, it sounds that they make reverberate off the walls of, of, of the tank. They're, they're constantly in an, in an acoustic fuzz. I think it's an incredibly stressful environment simply because of that. And how is your research here at Orca Lab different? Well, when I was um, working in, in captivity and understood that if one wanted really to learn about them, you needed to go into the wild and study them there at a distance. And mm -hmm. that's where we uh, got into developing uh, remote hydrophone systems that enable us to hear whales that we can't see. We have a network of hydrophones, covers about 50 square kilometers of the area around us, and we have speakers all over the place. We're listening to all of them all of the time, 24, 7, 365. <laughs> <laughs> but we're normally listening to a space, and there are many voices in that space. In a sort of general sense, we understand when the whales are doing certain things. We understand when they're chasing fish, for example, because we're hearing echolocation. We understand when they're resting, because they make these really sort of low-energy calls. But we don't know who the voices belong to. So I, I think a really fascinating area to get into is the question of who as, a, as individuals are we listening to. And if we can understand who's speaking, maybe ultimately we might begin to understand what is being said. I wanted to take all that I learned in captivity and apply it to wild whales. And so I contacted a brilliant scientist in Canada, Dr. Mike Big. And I asked him, do you know what family of whales or King Corky came from? Which sounds like an extraordinary request, but he at the time was photographing each dorsal fin and saddle, learning to tell them apart, collecting all the pictures from the capture. And there was a bunch of pictures that showed this whale we now call A23 with little baby Corky just before she was taken from her mom. So I had no boat experience. I threw everything into a pickup truck and we pumped up the Zodiac in Alert Bay and we went out there and I stopped and I put the hydrophones down, put on the headsets, and it was her family calling. And for the first time, I heard these sounds in their natural environment just rolling on and rolling on and echoing. And my first feeling was enormous guilt that it was me that was there, not Corky. But um, that's how I found them.
One promising factor in Keiko's finding his family was that orca calls can be heard 10 miles away. There was hope for a dialect match among the North Atlantic orcas, where Keiko would be reintroduced 100 miles from where he was captured. To prepare for his move, a bay pen was constructed in a pristine Icelandic bay. Finally, the day arrived to return Keiko to the home he barely knew. This had been Keiko's unexpected journey to freedom that millions of children demanded, but that no one knew exactly how to accomplish. Jean-Michel had watched Keiko's transformation for over two and a half years and had been witness to his devoted fans. Good luck. Even the U.S. Air Force had agreed to rent a C-17 cargo plane and crew for the trip, announcing it was in the best interest of the nation to fly Keiko home. He was covered in ointment for the flight to protect his skin from drying. After 15 anxious hours out of his element, Keiko was at last returned to the cold ocean waters of his birth. It was seen as the first step to restoring what had been taken away when he was captured. Keiko would first have to acclimate inside the confines of the bay pen. Months later, his world expanded to the enclosed bay, where for the first time, he ruled in relative freedom. It was Keiko's first chance at a small piece of the wild. Not since he was two years old had he experienced the sights and especially the complexity of sounds of a natural ocean environment. It had been 23 years, half his expected lifetime, since Keiko had even seen the bottom of the sea. Keiko's world was gradually expanding, and for the next step, a satellite tag was attached to his rare flop dorsal fin in order to follow him at sea. Its attachment was no more painful than piercing an ear, but the tag and Keiko would have to wait another season following complications to be tested at sea. Finally, in the summer of 2000, sea trials began. Everything from then on was up to Keiko. The difficult promise to give him the choice of freedom had been kept. Then at last, Keiko was within feet of wild killer whales. He seemed enthusiastic at first, but then experienced what might have been shyness or fear and turned back. Later encounters looked aggressive and Keiko continued to seek the shelter of the boat. Right there, Chad. Right there. Right there. Over three summers, Keiko continued to approach passing whales, spending more time with them, possibly learning their ways. Then in 2002, after watching a pod feed on herring, he simply swam away in the proximity of whales. For over two months, Keiko was tracked by satellite. His course revealed no details about his experiences in the wild, but he emerged a thousand miles away, sufficiently fed and unscathed. An enormous success. Then, perhaps seeking human companionship or just chasing an easy meal, Keiko followed a fishing boat into a Norwegian fjord. Keiko was still alone, but he was welcomed by enchanted children who must have felt they already knew him. Strong bonds are undeniably formed between captive orcas like Keiko and people. But we've been slow to consider that the ocean's greatest predator, wild and free, 
may also be curious to understand us. Hey, I see you there. Come on, come on. Hand out, hand out. Who's there? Come on, hand out. What are you doing? What are you doing? And I saw you. Do both of these whales take interest in your boat? Well, you know, as a scientist, you have to say no. Uh, but as a whale hugger, oh, for sure. You know, there's no doubt in my mind. In an effort to both protect orcas and to involve the public. Orca Hotline, Ingrid speaking. Ingrid founded the Orca Project Hotline. Oh, that's fantastic news. And so what direction were they going when you saw them? Her nationally advertised number rings with reports of orca sightings and strandings, like that of the whale she named Ben. Oh, Ben. He stranded in 1997. And I knew him before the stranding. But when you're involved with an animal at that sort of level, there's just something about it, you know, and they look you in the eye and they're at your mercy to rescue them. And with Ben, we had an overnight ordeal. And then we rescued him, and the next day he was back with another group of orca, which was just incredible. But a year later, uh, he got run over by a boat, and it was just tragic. But a year later, I found him. And his dorsal fin, the back half, had completely collapsed and folded over. So now he's got this funny little fin where a bit sticks up and the, the rest folds down. But he survived and he's very cautious of boats now. But he'll still come over to my boat. I think that by showing people the variation within the individuals, it makes the animals a little bit more personable, if you like. If somebody can call me up and say, hey, I just saw Ben, it gives them a little bit of a stake in Ben's life. And so hopefully, you know, they'll slow down their boats, they'll drive a little more respectfully. Uh, the data, of course, is really valuable for my research, but ultimately I want it to be that the public will want to protect these animals. Keiko, however, was at risk of being loved too much by a well-meaning public. The Norwegian government passed laws to protect him, and the Free Willy Keiko Foundation and the Humane Society of the U.S. agreed to continue his care. He arrived in Norway, obviously having fed himself at sea, but without fish in the fjord, concern grew, and the decision was made to begin feeding him again. Keiko had everything he needed, except the company of his own kind. In 2003, after more than a year in Norway, at age 26, relatively young for a male orca, Keiko took a final breath and died from a pneumonia-like virus. His burial was the last outpouring of affection for the whale we thought we knew and who had done everything we asked. Keiko was the whale we had forever changed. And no matter how good our intentions, he was the whale we couldn't fix for him to become what nature had intended, an orca in the close company of other whales. It wasn't possible, even for the world's most loved, most famous whale. I think it would be quite impossible for anybody to propose capturing an orca, at least in North American waters at this point. So I think uh, in that sense we've come quite a long way in terms of public attitudes. In terms of what we understand about orcas, uh, we've also come a long way. I think at this point we understand enough about uh, orca society to realize that this is complex and remarkable and fascinating. And uh, we, we don't have the whole story yet, but what we do understand is really, really interesting. The debate about returning captive orcas to the wild 
and keeping them in captivity continues passionately, especially as we learn more about them, and continue to discover that there may be few other species more like ourselves. There do still remain countries tolerant of capturing orcas, but in most of the world, any up-close, hands-on contact comes when a whale ends up on the beach, stranded. Ingrid Visser is again changing what we know. You know, there was a lot of controversy, and there still is, about saving stranded whales and dolphins. People say that they have crushed internal organs from, from sitting on the beach for so long, and then other people say that uh, they're no longer viable. The stress hormones and all of this sort of thing that these animals can't reproduce and that they're basically a drain on society if you put them back because they're going to be eating fish and contributing nothing. So Miracle, um, she's stranded. She was rescued and then I saw her again after the rescue three years later and then about five years later she had her first calf and that calf is called Magic. So it was really, really incredible to see Miracle, who had the stranding event, being rescued and then had her very first calf and the calf has survived. So yeah, magic it was. Come on! <laughs> How cool was that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> In the middle of her research, Henry gets a call that a small female orca is stranded on an isolated beach in heavy surf. She and the team rush to assist. She's somewhere on this bit of coastline here. We're not sure exactly where, but this area here, these lines on the chart are marking that it's really rough and surf breaking. So we're kind of hoping we'll be able to pick her up and move her by tractor and trailer somewhere into here. Okay, well, let's do it. Go. Time is critical in a stranding rescue. So Ingrid and Jean-Michel will fly directly while the team drives the five hours to the site. New Zealand's hills are bordered by a twisting 9,300 mile coastline. Whale strandings are fairly common, but successful rescues are not. The orca was first sighted around one o'clock by some hikers in a very remote part of the west coast, west of Auckland tossing and turning in the surf. We uh, ultimately got to the beach and indeed this uh, young female, a little over three meters long, was uh, very badly stranded. So when we actually first saw her, of course there's just the natural emotions of just wanting to break down and cry and, and knowing that she's away from her family and knowing that she has no idea of where people that are going to help her or hurt her. But help comes by digging holes for her flukes and flippers to relieve the discomfort, then keeping her skin moist. She was probably not alone, struggling in the surf, and another whale may have tried to pull her back to sea, judging from the marks raked across her tailstock. Ingrid names her Reiki. Most important to her survival is keeping the young whale hydrated after hours of stress on the beach. Ingrid is successful in getting her to accept a tube bringing water. Yeah. It's a triage that also involves reassurance and comfort. Even with expert care under changing conditions, it's believed that an orca can survive only about 24 hours out of water. Hopefully, she'll be okay. And hopefully, we united with her pod. She's a young female, needs her family. We're very, very anxious to see her back in the ocean, in her world. We move the animal just um, just right up above this uh, tiny little town where there is a facility where we could pull the truck and the trailer right next to a freshwater source. So we had a hose where we could water her down and we had an ongoing watch throughout the night. But finally by 4 a.m. we knew it was time for Ingrid and, and Carl and the team to discuss what the options were to get her back into the water. Me and family, Carl and I have 
done orca streamings before where two hours after we released the orca um, it met up with its family so the, it can be a long way away and the animals will return if they hear her but they won't be able to hear her calling if she's inside here over the bar with the surf but then if we take her to the other coast it's 100 percent guaranteed she won't find her family immediately yeah that's the worst con Mm. Um, for both scenarios is that where is her family? I, I defer to you more for not biological yeah. in terms of your knowledge.